thank you for joining us today. I'm Dustin Willis, and I serve as a part of the leadership of Haggai International. Today is a special day as we join together from all over the world to mourn the loss of our founder, but also to celebrate the life and the legacy of Dr. John Edmund Haggai. Dr. Haggai's love for the Lord, his passion for the gospel, and his faithfulness to the Great Commission was unmatched. And we pray that you get to see a picture of that through today's service. This memorial service is being held in the Cecil B. Day Chapel at Perimeter Church in Johns Creek, Georgia, in the United States. This chapel is named after a great man, a great friend of Dr. Haggai, who was critical to Haggai's equipping center being started in Singapore. Fittingly, it was named after Cecil B. Day as well. So today, from this beautiful chapel, we celebrate Dr. John Edmund Haggai. We want to give as many people as possible the opportunity to join us here online. So we'll get started in just a few minutes. The order of service can be found at haggai-international.org forward slash memorial. And the opportunity to give a gift in memory of Dr. Haggai can also be located right there on the website. We are grateful that you're here and we will get started in just a few minutes.
the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with everyone gathered here and and with all of our sisters and brothers gathered around God's good world. I welcome you to a memorial service celebrating the life and the legacy and leadership of Dr. John Edmund Haggai. It is a high honor to welcome you into a a celebration like this, and it occurs to me that whether you are near or far, there is something that has compelled you to tune into this moment, to honor a life that was well lived, but to glorify God because of it. So we want to be very clear about what we're doing in this service. We're here to honor John Haggai by glorifying God. There's no memorial service, or a memorial service is, is like un, unlike any other kind of gathering or experience that we have. Where else are, are we asked to steward two seemingly opposite energies in the human heart than like a moment like this, where we come to both grieve and, and celebrate? We come to grieve because we're, we're told in sacred scripture that there is a time and a season for every kind of occasion under the heavens. And one of those times is a time, a season for grief, for sorrow, for mourning. And those who were impacted by the life and leadership and ministry of Dr. Haggai understands. And some of you, uh, more intimately than others, you understand that there is a loss that will be felt for some time. This world will feel different without Dr. Haggai in it. And and he is worth our grief, our tears. But but we're also told, promised in sacred scripture that, that though we may grieve, and sometimes grieve bitterly, we are not like those who grieve with no hope. It's because of the resurrection of Christ from death that we have this hope that these are not the last things. That because of the resurrection of Christ, we celebrate a, a victory that gives us hope that one day we all may be embraced by the same eternal love that embraces Dr. Haggai this very moment. So, what word from God should we hear? Hear this. Whether you're able to celebrate today, and tell wonderful stories about the impact that he had on your life, whether you're able to celebrate and laugh with joy or you're only able to feel a kind of loss or a numbed emptiness because you recognize that his loss is a great loss and maybe you're mindful this day of your own mortality and finitude wherever you are as you enter into this moment. You need to know that God sees where you are and welcomes you just as you are. So let's take a moment and yield before that kind of God in a moment of prayer. Will you pray with me? Good and loving God, we pause to give thanks to you for the life of John Haggai. We give you thanks for the ways in which His life was a light unto all for the ways that he made an indelible imprint in the lives of each of us and all of us for the sake of your kingdom. So we give you thanks for the ways in which his life impacted ours, but we we also give you thanks for the inspiration this day even as we honor his legacy and recall the ways in which he has been faithful to the vision you put inside his heart and mind, we pray this day that you would strengthen our own resolve to be as faithful. And in so doing, we pray that what we say here this day, what we remember, what we hold up to lift and give back to you, does more than simply honor one man's life, but truly 
in every sincere way, glorifies the God for whom he lived. So we pray that you are honored and glorified in all that we attempt to do in your name this day. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of life. Amen. And now a a tribute video has been produced to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. John Haggai, and we'll turn our attention to that as we continue in our celebration. In spite of grave risks, their passion is to evangelize their own people. As a new world unfolded, it was clear that gospel poverty was growing. In 1964, while visiting the Middle East, John Edmund Haggai saw that traditional missions could not cope with the growing demands. During that same time, the Vietnam War escalated as 3,500 U.S. Marines were dispatched to fight a ground war. And just one year later, in China, Mao Zedong launched the Cultural Revolution. It was obvious. The world was changing. One man who brought about such change was Martin Luther King Jr., who was tragically assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. In 1969, the first man walked on the moon, and the first gathering of what would become the Haggai Leader Experience took place in Switzerland, with 19 leaders from four nations. Within two years, Haggai's first dedicated training center opened in Singapore. Back in the U.S., a burglary in Washington, D.C. triggered what became known as the Watergate scandal. I let the American people down. Facing huge demand, Haggai pressed forward with their mission and introduced the first national seminars, starting in Thailand and Iran. Change continued when two guys by the name of Steve started a company called Apple that would forever alter how we listen to music, make phone calls, and yeah, they make computers too. Hello, I am Macintosh. As the world progressed, Haggai recognized women in leadership with the first Haggai women's leader experience. And while Haggai was moving forward in advancing the gospel, Ayatollah Khomeini returned from exile to start the Iranian revolution. With Islamic extremism on the rise, Haggai did not sit back and watch gospel poverty grow, but instead started high security seminars in the heart of the Middle East. Tension rose when Mehmet Ali Akka, a Turkish gunman, attempted to assassinate Pope John Paul II. With an ambition to see nations redeemed, a cultural exchange enriched Haggai's long relationship with the People's Republic of China. And finally, after 28 years, the fall of the Berlin Wall marked the end of the Cold War. In 1993, with a vision to expand operations, Haggai established the world-class Mid-Pacific Center in Maui. Months later, Nelson Mandela became South Africa's first black president. As the world continued to change, Haggai remained determined to tell the world of Jesus, reaching the goal of training 10,000 by 2,000. We all remember where we were on September 11, 2001, in that moment when Al-Qaeda terrorists flew commercial airliners into the Twin Towers. And seven years later, global stock markets came crashing down as the financial crisis hit rock bottom. Undaunted and with a faith-driven motivation, Haggai leaders held the first Asia Alumni Summit. God was indeed moving through these incredible leaders, and surveys revealed that Haggai leader experience was boosting the number of times that leaders shared the gospel by 130%. As the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 hit the world, we innovatively launched the virtual Haggai leader experience in addition to our traditional equipping in an effort to multiply more leaders in more places at a faster rate than ever. Today, 2.2 billion people have not heard the gospel. And in a year when our founder went to be with the Lord, we are more focused than ever to build on his life and his legacy. Haggai International has intentionally equipped over 123,000 leaders in 189 countries and territories. Standing on the shoulders of the spiritual giant who built this ministry, we are unwavering in our work to catalyze strategically positioned leaders who will advance the gospel. Together with you, we can end gospel poverty. Dr. Haggai asked that these scriptures 
be read at his memorial service. Psalm 116.15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 to 18, I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, concerning those who have fallen asleep in death, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring, him, bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 17 and 20 through 27. When Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary stayed at home. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Dr. Hege, I also ask, for great is thy faithfulness. Now, it's the unofficial hymn of Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, Illinois, where John and Christine met in the early 40s. William Runyon, who had composed the music for the hymn in 1943, worked at Moody while the Hegyas were there. The song is also John Hegyas testimony. Dr. Hegyas has written that he learned through his experience with his son Johnny that God allows no need in our lives for which he does not provide adequate supply. John Hegyas believed that regardless of challenges, God is faithful to provide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. See you. 
I bring greetings in the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ to our family, Haggai family across the globe. I'm Bev Upton Williams, Chief Executive Officer of Haggai International, but to the man that we remember, honor, and celebrate today, I was Lady Dr. Bev. And that's where I would like for us to begin at a very personal level, and I want you to do the same. We all know the unparalleled accomplishments of Dr. John Edmund Haggai over 75 years of ministry. Therefore, I wanna focus in the next few minutes on how he impacted me and you personally. Those are the memories front and center that we really bring to this celebration today. And you know, they'll continue long after our time together. And I know that he would hope that these memories somehow would spur us to higher levels of effectiveness so that we could accomplish even greater things for God's kingdom. Would you think for a moment in your journey when your path crossed that of Dr. Haggai's? You and I both know it was a God-ordained moment and it would transform our lives in, in ways unique to each of us. Yet, I believe commonalities exist in the what we all experience. Our interaction shaped our thinking, it expanded and molded our faith in God, and it left an impression indelibly written on our hearts and minds that with him, nothing, absolutely nothing was impossible. More importantly, Dr. John's passion for the gospel 
strength, uh, strengthened our own resolve and commitment to ensure that everybody had the opportunity to hear and respond about Jesus. For me, Dr. John was a mentor, and in his early days, in my early days at Haggai, he helped me transform my leadership style from the corporate world that also added to it spiritual leadership while still maintaining the standards of excellence required by the ministry. I understood really early on at Haggai that if I achieved anything worth only a half of hallelujah, I would be in real trouble with a man whose name was on the top of the letterhead. Speaking of which, he reminded me frequently, as long as his name was on that letterhead, we would adhere to the principles and values which he had long been following. As you can imagine, Dr. John said this with such emphasis and vigor that none of us had any doubt what he meant. And between you and me, as I discovered, it was a really good idea to build on the foundation of those sound and God-inspired principles. I so loved and admired that about him. His convictions were clear, rooted in God's word, motivated by Jesus' command, fueled by his passion for souls, and crafted into a vision that lit a fire in our hearts and inspired all of us to join him in reaching the whole world with the gospel. Briefly, here are some of the things that I learned from him that I will carry for the rest of my life, and in fact, they'll continue to inform and shape who I am and how I lead. I have a feeling some of you will relate to this too. First, time is our scarcest resource. We must focus on the one thing that God has placed in our hearts to do. A phrase that he admired and quoted frequently was this, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. He was all about permanence and the very selective investment of time. His admonition was this, understand the dream that God has placed in your heart, set goals around it, lay out a plan of action, make a commitment to fulfilling those goals, look to the Lord for grace and guidance, and decisively move ahead. Spend your time doing only what you can do. His advice was to forsake all else. He himself was absolutely loyal to this principle, so loyal that he didn't engage in some of the more mundane but necessary activities of daily living. A quick story related to that. He frequently called me and often just launched into what he wanted or needed uh, from me. So I answered the phone one day and I hear that booming voice, where's the milk? That one totally floored me. And the only thing I could say was, is Gladys at home? Can, can you ask her where the milk is? And she said, no, Gladys is at home. I'm not at home. I'm at the grocery store. And I thought, surely he's joking. He always jokes with me. So I gave it right back to him. No, no, no. This isn't John Edmund Haggai because he does not go to the grocery store. Gruffly, he thundered, if you're done haranguing me, will you just please tell me how to find the milk in this place? He was indeed in the grocery store. I stayed on the phone and talked to him until he got to the milk. He just didn't do grocery stores or dry cleaners. Like Paul who said this, this one thing I do, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We all know Dr. Hayaz's life was intensely focused on getting the gospel to the ends of the earth, on his family, and on his relationships with you, and basically nothing else. He could do that. He could focus on these things because God placed people in his path along the way to support him in a significant way. I'd like to say a thank you to two of those individuals right now, a heartfelt thank you. First, Gladys Tatro, and really her entire family for more than 20 years, provided support for the Haggai household, focused on providing care for Christine, 
until her death last year, Dr. Haggai's wife. No one ever received more professional care with a huge dose of love than Christine did during the many years of living with Alzheimer's. And Gladys took great care of the doctor, as she called Dr. John. Gladys, to each one of you, thank you. John Bachman, you gave 37 years of service to Dr. Haggai, and as I've often said, no one, no one could have served him like you did, traveling, researching, working on speeches with him, scrambling when in the middle of the talk, he suddenly thought of three or more pictures he'd like to show the audience. John did it all, anything and everything that he needed, often providing it before he even asked. And Cynthia, thank you. I'm acutely aware of the sacrifice that you've made across the years. I know that John was virtually never with you on your birthday, nor were you together on your anniversary. Thank you both. Another important principle that Dr. Hagee I helped me to understand a deep level was this, and I love this one. I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, you all know his father, Wadi, was a Greek scholar, and he said this is not translated correctly. The, tr the correct translation is this. I am almighty in the one who keeps continually pouring his power into me. I am almighty in the one who keeps continually pouring his power into me. I hold that thought really close to my heart. It really encourages me. And above all, Dr. Haggai was the ultimate encourager. He often reminded our Haggai leaders being equipped in Maui, you're unique with your own set of special gifts. You can do things that no one else can do. You will achieve things that nobody else can achieve. There will be some people touched with the message of the gospel who would otherwise never be touched but for you. What I came to understand that what I do each and every day in my role makes a difference for someone's salvation. It really is a matter of life and death. While Dr. Hege, I knew that God was working in us and through us to accomplish his own purposes, he insisted we must work always as, every, as though everything depended on us. Diligence coupled with excellence ruled the day. And oh, by the way, you could do it much better if you had on a coat and foremost a tie, Sam Neff. Neckties are one of those absolute truths, aren't they? Well, that didn't work too well for me. However, he helped me compensate for this great shortcoming by always introducing me to new people as the best man we have. I took it as a compliment. Third, we all learned we must stand on the word of God. One of the thoughts he often expounded was this, it's easy to believe in God. But the real question is, do you believe God? Do you believe he will be and do everything he promises us? Believing God requires faith. He told me over and over that the most frequent prayer he played, prayed to God was, God, give me the faith of Abraham. Faith in his father was the key to living a life that mattered. It was his faith and complete obedience to, to God along with the people like yourselves who came alongside of him to support this ministry that resulted in Haggai International being the powerful force for the gospel that it is today. Finally, he believed in the power of prayer. There were countless stories all along the life of this ministry that only prayer could conquer as God answered the prayers of his faithful servant who absolutely believed that God would come through. He always did. He said this, prayer is the means, where, means whereby you permit and invite God to so energize you that to his glory, you live victoriously, overcoming the world, the flesh, and the devil. He was a prayer warrior for you and for me. When he committed to praying for someone, he did it. 
He had a written prayer list over five pages long that he went through every single day. And not only did he do that, he recorded it on his iPhone. So if he happened to be someplace where he couldn't get to the list, he would listen to it and pray. He taught me that the most important thing I could do was spend time with Jesus and pray. Everything else would follow. God would ordain and direct my steps. In a conversation occurring in the last year, I made a request of Dr. John. I told him that I had really no basis for what I was about to ask, but my heart told me that I should do so. I said this, I said, Dr. John, I know you pray for me daily. When the Lord takes you home to heaven, will you commit to continuing to pray and intercede on my behalf and that of the ministry when you get there? In a way, it really was a request of a daughter to this man who was like a second father to me. It always gave me such great comfort that he was praying for me, and I knew that I would need it when he was no longer present. He committed to doing so, and I'm grateful. As CEO of Haggai International, I now want to make a commitment to each of you and to the Lord. This ministry will not only continue to be absolutely true and loyal to the vision and the mission that God gave John Edmund Haggai, but with God's help, we will significantly expand the scope of the work beyond all that we could ask or think. We must do so. There are 2.2 billion people who live and die without having heard of Jesus if we don't keep our commitment of reaching them with the good news. We've set a goal. It's a big audacious goal, but it after all is in our DNA. We're going to equip at least a million leaders in the next 10 years with God's help and with his provision, protection, and blessing, we will achieve it. Please pray for us. A few final thoughts. We're so blessed in this ministry to have quite a few families who have three generations now involved in Haggai International. Austin, that would be you. I was on a Zoom call, as God would have it, with two of our third generation trustees when I received the text from John Bachman that Dr. Haggai was in heaven. Each of their grandfathers served as board chairs many years ago. Gracie Collins Small, and Jim McCormick. They grew up in this ministry, as did Austin and others that are a part of that group. And I had the opportunity to travel around the world with them. And I thought to myself, how fitting is this, that this is the generation that will take this ministry forward, and I'm on a Zoom call with them. Dr. Haggia always loved and poured himself into the youngest generation involved with this ministry. We must too. Later that evening, I received a text from Gracie who sent a photo. I had to really expand it to be able to see it. It was a Haggia publication with an article written by Dr. John. She asked me to read the last sentence, and it said this. He wrote, you want to make a difference? I'll be frank with you. Your life will never obtain, attain optimum significance apart from total obedience to our Lord's command to take the gospel to the entire world. That's categorical. And underline was to the entire world. She finished her text by saying, that sums it all up to me. I believe it sums it up for all of us, doesn't it? His journey is finished. One day in heaven, we will rejoice with the many who are there because of Dr. Haggai's faithfulness and all that God did in and through him. And I pray that this will be true for each and every one of us as well, that multitudes of individuals and families are in heaven because of our obedience to the command that Jesus gave to make disciples of all nations, all, every single one of them. I close now with a prayer you've heard so many times that he prayed for each one of us. 
Lord, help us to be and do everything we shall have wished we had been and done when we stand before you. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. I'd like to transition now to thinking about our Haggai leaders. They were so important to him, and Haggai leaders who are watching this, you know that. You're our partners in the cause of the gospel in places that we can't go. I encourage you to take some time to read some of their tributes on our memorial page on our website. But right now, we're going to have an opportunity to watch a video of leaders telling us what Dr. Haggai meant to them. I am Sundar Sangma from India. To me, Dr. Haggai is a light. Today, the light has gone, leaving behind hundreds and thousands of lights around the world. Dr. Haggai called me the Iron Lady, and I described him a mind changer, a life changer. Dr. Haggai was strategic and methodical in his approach to advancing the gospel. He said begin at the top and focus on the top leaders in society. This was a total paradigm shift for me. Dr. Haggai was a passionate person and he impacted me the first time I sat under his ministry in 1975 in Singapore with a razor sharp focus that he had on training influential leaders to fulfill the Great Commission. To me, Dr. John Edmund Haggai was a super inspirer. Since my Haggai leader experience in 1985, Dr. Haggai had been an unseen inspiration until I met him for the first time in 2000. Dr. Haggai was a winner, a winner in everything he set out to do, and a winner of souls for Jesus Christ. He won me over in accelerating my passion for winning others for eternity. I first met Dr. Heger as a participant from Fiji in Singapore in 2003, and I was awestruck. There began my journey with this amazing man of God, full of love for those who did not know Jesus. I have been on fire for the Lord since Singapore 2003. I have the privilege of serving under the leadership of Dr. John Edmund Haggai for 13 years, first as Director of Training for Maui, and then as International Director of Training for Maui and Singapore. It was in 1998. I had just finished speaking at the convocation ceremony as a participant at the Mid-Pacific Center in Maui. And there was Dr. Edmund Haggai walking up to me and saying, Young man, will you believe me if I told you that I'd never seen a finer speaker come out of the continent of Africa? I knew you wouldn't believe me. And he walked away smiling. He was right, I didn't believe him. But by the time I did, it altered the trajectory of my life, my ministry, and my career. Dr. Hekai has changed my mind. And he has changed the way I think. He has changed my life. Today we have trained more than 50,000 leaders nationally. And we have supported two full sessions in Maui. His impact on my life is I have no option as a Christian servant but to succeed. I have no option but to make a difference. I have no option but to enjoy life in spite of all the busy schedule and to glorify his name in everything I do. Dr. Haggai enhanced my passion for lost souls and he will continue to inspire me in eternity. God enabled me to personally equip over 20,000 leaders for evangelism across nations. He enabled me to recognize God's agenda for my life. The next 20 years, in his close proximity, he inspired me to make impossible things possible. One such thing as being 
developing hundreds of Haggai facilitators globally for both international and national ministries, apart from equipping thousands of global leaders for evangelism. Praise God. Now as executive director of Kampala Capital City, which is a political appointment, I am not shying away from leadership, but I'm using it to reach the 4 million residents in our city. We have over 1,500 employees, and these are all opportunities for the fragrance of the gospel to spread in our society. Through our ministry, we have planted directly over 100 new churches and countless more through the workers that we have trained, addressing the most important crisis in this world, the crisis of gospel poverty. So greatly blessed is Haggai, and greatly used by God, that only eternity will reveal the number of leaders he has impacted and the rippling effects of their influence for the gospel. To the nations. In fact, Dr. Haggai changed the paradigm of missions. He will always be remembered as the father of strategic evangelism. Dr. Haggai, you are the mind changer of our national ministry and you have changed the world by changing the mindset of the leaders. Thank you, Dr. Haggai, for your vision your passion, and your life of love. Thank you for igniting the passion in my heart to win others for eternity. We will miss you. My husband Albert and alumni too, and I look forward to the day we will meet again. I am so grateful for what Haggai Institute and Dr. Haggai in specific taught all the people around us and all the ministries all over the world. Thank you, Dr. Haggai. See you in heaven. I am grateful. We love you. By the way, those leaders tell us there will be a Haggai corner in heaven. And we'll all meet there one day to rejoice what the many, many children of John Edmund Haggai have accomplished over the years uh, since they attended the Haggai Leader Experience. I'd like to introduce Dr. George Sweeting. He's a longtime friend of Dr. John and only about six months older than he is with, I think you'll recognize a voice that's very similar. He was not only the president of Moody Bible uh, Institute, but he was the best man in Dr. John and Christine's wedding. My name is George Sweeting, a pastor evangelist and a close friend of John Edmund Haggai. In 1942, I enrolled as a student of the Moody Bible Institute of Chicago, Illinois. And that's where I met John Edmund Haggai. He was age 18 from the state of Massachusetts. I'm five months younger than John. John was energetic, super optimistic, bold, and vocal about his goals for life. Some thought that John was overconfident. However, most of his dreams really came true. John's parents were also graduates of the Moody Bible Institute of Chicago in the year 1913. Mildred and Waddy Haggai were a choice couple. John's father was a good pastor. I had the honor of leading several evangelistic series at churches he pastored. John's father came from Damascus, Syria, and his mother, Mildred, was from New England. They were a loving couple with three sons. While I was a student at the Moody Bible Institute, 
I led a series of evangelistic services at the Euclid Avenue Baptist Church in Bristol, Virginia. And that's where I met Christine Barker. I urged her to think about coming to Moody as a student, and she did. And that's where she met John Edmund Haggai. They courted, and one day after graduation, they were married. I was there, and I had the privilege of serving as their best man. Over the years, I've had the honor of ministering in each church that John pastored. Our friendship was warm and continued for 78 years. I'm sure all of John's friends know that John was a super user of the phone. He would phone me every week and sometimes every day and sometimes several times a day. In old age, he would repeat some of the same phrases. He would end saying, George, you have an exceptional set of pipes, referring to my voice. But best of all about John, from childhood, he had a heart for Asia. He had a heart, of course, for the whole world. But Asia was his passion. I sincerely love John, and I miss him already deeply. And I can't wait to see him in heaven. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion to the day of Jesus Christ. Well, to... uh... To say that Dr. Haggai was a major influence in my life would be a gross understatement. When I was just a uh, a teenager, I heard the gospel in my stadium of the high school I would be going to shortly, excuse me, and and, uh, it was this man, Dr. John Haggai, and I walked the aisle that, that week and made a profession of faith in Christ. Little did I realize that my then unknown but future wife was in a city about 60 miles away, and the next summer, same thing, a crusade that he was holding in their city, her city. She walked forward and made a profession of faith in Christ. It was later that he became, Dr. Haggai became uh, dear friends with my parents, and so I got to see him in my home. And Mrs. Haggai and Johnny and had the privilege of getting uh, to, uh, to know them as a family. As I came to the end of my seminary uh, years, I was wrestling with what I would do with my life. And Dr. Haggai made an offer to me that I just was overwhelmed with and assumed that this would be my future direction in life. And he said, uh, you know, we've taken this whole thing overseas And would love for you to be as a right-hand person, to work alongside, and and, and I could mentor you and so forth. Well, you got to understand what that meant to a young man like me. And I thought, what could there be any better? As I prayed, as he encouraged me to pray about it, I don't know why, but there was a sense of which I knew. And and my, my new wife, Carol, knew this was not the right thing, and we didn't know why. So I went to see Dr. Haggai. I sat down with him, and I said, I don't understand it. I would assume this is where I should be. I have no idea what I should do. And he then gave that, all of us know the statement, attempt something so great for God, it's doomed to fail, let God be in it. He said, you go home and think about that. He prayed for me, I prayed, and it was through his influence and his direction that uh, Perimeter Church here was started. I know without a doubt, were it not for his influence on my life, never would have been the case. And it was him who, as you would expect, he pressed me to say, if you start a church, you do missions differently. And those most important words, equip indigenous leaders. That's the way he thought. And I couldn't help but do anything else. He's been such a special man. 
called me week in, week out. I call him, uh, talking to him. Amazing. I consider his friendship to me and the influence he had on me and my ministry to be the greatest blessing I could have ever asked for. For the brief message that I am honored to bring, I'd like for us to use our imaginations. And I'd like to allow us to hear, in essence, from Dr. Haggai. Imagine, two and a half weeks ago now, right? He went to be with the Lord. Imagine he's been in heaven for two and a half weeks. And he gets a, an assignment from his gracious father and says, I want you to go and I want you to speak to the Haggai family. How we know that's not going to happen? We know that could not happen. But let's imagine, what if it did happen? What, what do you think he would say to you, his Haggai family, his closest of friends and loved ones? Well, nobody would know, certainly, but my knowledge of him, plus uh, what I can only imagine that he's experienced in that two and a half week period, would lead me to suggest that it would include at least these four things. Number one. I think he'd say this, eternal life with Jesus is a whole lot better than even you great saints of God could ever imagine. You'd have to see it to believe it. Perhaps he would quote, and I must say from memory, as he would, the late great R.C. Ryle describing heaven and this after Christ's return. He says it passes human power to conceive. It can only be measured by contrast and comparison. At eternal rest, after warfare and conflict, the eternal company of saints, after buffeting from an evil world, an eternally glorious and painless body, after struggling with weakness and infirmity, an eternal sight of Jesus face to face, after only hearing and believing. All this is blessedness indeed, and yet the half of it remains untold. Knowing Dr. Haggai, he would have no hesitation to correct even Dr. Riles. Those last words he used, and yet the half of it remains untold. I think perhaps Dr. Haggai would say, half untold? What are you talking about? No way. Based on just what I've seen thus far, it's more, more accurate to say 99% untold. Can you imagine what he's seen right now? He'd tell us about it. And then it would be his prompting to admonish us to live in light of eternity. And I can't help but think he would go back to Romans 8 and say to all of us, you know, that suffering of this present world, you're living it. Don't let it even be a comparison to the focus that you've got on that which is yet to come, the glory that I've now seen. And he would say, trust me, friends. You live for eternity. It's worth it. Number two, I think he might say this, the gospel is a whole lot better than you folks could ever imagine it to be. He'd probably say, I, I know you all know the meaning of gospel is good news. And he'd say, I've spent my entire life preaching that great news. But I'm telling you, folks, now after what I've seen, mm -mm, you don't know the half of the depth and the beauty and the wonder of this thing called the gospel. You just can't know. Here's what I know to be true now, he might say. First, I know at the fall of man, we didn't just lose a lot. We lost it all. We didn't just lose our perfection. We didn't even just lose our goodness. In fact, we lost everything. Our best of goodness, we lost it in the fall. We've been hopeless without Jesus. He said, you know what else I know about this gospel now is I see it richer than I could ever have imagined. 
that on that cross, Jesus didn't just do a lot. He did it all. He would say, folks, don't believe for a minute that he paid for our sins. And then we bring our own, you know, righteousness maybe from our faith and our repentance. And we bring our little and he brings his lot. No, no, no. He'd say, he did it all. He did it all. And then he would conclude by saying, you know what? We don't just get a lot. We get it all. We get every bit. I'm talking about not just heaven. I'm not talking about just forgiveness. I'm talking about the full righteousness of Jesus. Perhaps he would quote 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now no condemnation, friends. Fully righteous. And he might say to us, whom he loves so much, folks, don't get caught in the performance trap in your walk with Jesus. You just remember, we lost it all. He did it all. And we get it all. Thirdly, perhaps Jesus would say that, or uh, Nakti Haggai would say this about Jesus. Say, you know what, folks? Jesus is far more holy and far more loving than you have ever imagined. Maybe he'd say something like this. You know, bad stuff does happen in this world in which we live. He would say, Christine and I knew that as we experienced a life watching our beloved Johnny. Everything he went through, everything we went through. But don't believe the lie when you're going through the worst. Don't believe the lie that God does not do all things well. Don't you think for a minute that Romans 8.28 isn't exactly what it says. Everything, you'll see, everything is an expression of his love. You'd probably say, if you don't love him with all your heart, it's because you just don't see how loving he is. Stare at the cross and just see what he's done for you. Then lastly, he might say something like this. I would at least expect it. He'd say, I know you believe a lot in Haggai Institute. But let me tell you, now based on what I've seen, you have no idea the impact of Haggai Institute. Oh, I know we had our statistics and many people say the statistics maybe blow it up a little out of proportion. He's going to say, no. You're talking about the, not knowing the half of it? He said, you don't know the half of it. What God has done through Haggai Institute. And that he would say, please, you keep on investing in Haggai Institute. You watch. You see. And when you end up where I am, you're going to applaud Every investment you've made. He would appeal to his Haggai family. And he would simply say, this gospel poverty we're talking about, let's get rid of it. Keep, please, keep investing in Haggai Institute. Perhaps eventually having to be interrupted by his attending angel, say it's time to return. I'm going to be back in the heavenlies. I would imagine that he would have to have at least one more word to say. And he'd say, give me just this one thought. And with that, he would say, I want to bless you. And with that blessing, perhaps he would use those words of Jude when he would say to him, Jesus, to him in each of your lives, you Haggai family that I love so much, let there be glory and majesty, dominion and power now and forever. Amen. Well, obviously, we couldn't have Dr. Haggai here to speak with us today. But uh, I don't think it would be a, a proper memorial service uh, for him 
without hearing his voice. And I am not mean just imagined, but real. So please enjoy this brief montage of Dr. Haggai preaching. I wish I could be with you in person, but since I cannot, this is the best way I know. And I hope that you will listen as carefully as if I were there. I must tell you that I find it much easier to look you in the eye, but since I can't look in your eye, I'll look in the eye of this camera and hope that you will receive it as I feel it. I believed that Jesus Christ did not commission us to failure. And those were the days of the 60s, big dreams in America. Put a man on the moon. By the time we had our first session for third world leaders in 1969, Neil Armstrong had stepped on the moon and practically everybody in the world knew that. But two thirds of the people of the world did not know that Jesus Christ had died on a cross 2000 years ago. This I found unacceptable. Thank God for all the Bible study groups. May I utter a word of caution here? I'm constantly running into people whose Bibles and notebooks are full of new insights, but who rarely present to someone the claims of Christ. What part does God want you to have? I invite you to join the team. I need your help. And together, as laborers together, with Jesus Christ, we'll have the opportunity of making available the gospel to multiplied millions where traditional Western missions is no longer acceptable. Your name will not be on a bronze plaque. There will not be any tangible expression of what you have done, but you will invade a nation where the gospel of Jesus Christ. In spite of grave risks, their passion is to evangelize their own people. To the disciple, he is the commander-in-chief who gives us our orders with unmistakable and unconditional clarity. He is Christ the incomparable. Without an appeal for a verdict, is not the work of an evangelist woefully incomplete? What are you doing? This is the demand of the gospel. Jesus Christ appeals for a verdict. Consider the word come from the very beginning of his ministry to the very end. But here again, if you do not know the Lord, if you have not received him as your savior, you must give your life without any restriction, without any hesitation, holding nothing back, you come to God as a self-confessed sinner. You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You confess Him publicly as such before the world and strive to live so as to please Him day by day. I hope you'll make that decision this morning. Little minds tend to abuse words and drain them of their meanings. But words have imperial power. They are the bridge between person and person, between Almighty God and the human race. What did God write upon the tablets of stone? Words. What did Jesus Christ utter on Mount Olivet? Words. Out of what did Christ strike the spark for the illumination of the universe? Out of words. Let there be light, and there was light. Shakespeare employed 15,000 different words in drama. Milton employed 8,000 different words in poetry. Rufus Schott employed over 11,000 different words in law. Sadly, the average modern person can muster less than 1,000 for everything. And judging by some congregations I've seen in the last two decades, that would be a stretch. And among the most frequently used are excited. There's two words you'll never hear me use. One is excited and the other is share. Or cool. <laughs> or awesome. Or, you know, <laughs> the Bible has 12,193 different words and it behooves us to take full advantage of that vocabulary to explore fully the glories of the incomparable Christ. 
God does not merely wish you to make a difference. He does not merely hope for you to make a difference. He commands it. He tells you to go out there and change things globally, exponentially. There's no such thing as being right with God and wrong on the money issue. I do not know of donors anywhere in the world who measure up to the character, dedication, and generosity of the donors of this ministry. I mean that. Christ is king. He is sovereign. And we are his subjects. We sing, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. How long is that? And ever and ever. And when you get through all of the forevers, then you can say, amen and amen. Where, O oh death, is thy sting? Where, O oh grave, is thy victory? Our Lord Jehovah's Christ, the resurrection, it is he who has broken death's portals. It is he who has made through death's territory a passage wide for all believers to the land of promise. The sting of death is sin. But through the Lord Jesus Christ, that's been forgiven. The strength of sin is the law. Through Christ Jesus, the law ceases to thunder, for he has fulfilled it and he has become our friend. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Sunrise tomorrow, sunrise tomorrow, sunrise in glory is waiting for me. What a great grace to be able to have shared in this celebration of life, to remember and to lift back up to God a life so well lived for God. For Dr. Haggai, everything was about Christ. At our church, we end every worship service with the same benediction. And we now come to a benediction in this memorial service. From time to time, Dr. Haggai would uh, remain afterwards to comment, uh, sometimes the same comment, about my um, 
benediction because it is borrowed from the, the breastplate of St. Patrick. Yeah, it's adapted a bit, but I, I want to offer this to you, both to those who are here gathered and to all of our sisters and brothers gathered around the world. So as you are able, uh, please stand for the benediction. And may these words be the parting words of strength for you as you continue in the call to which you've been called. Wherever it is that you go from here, may Christ go before you to prepare your way. May Christ go behind you on the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step forward at a time. May Christ both go to your right and to your left, abiding closer than even a sister or a brother. May Christ go above you on the days when dark clouds roll in to remind you there is one above the clouds who at the end of the day has the final word. May Christ go beneath you, girding you with confidence and removing all forms of fear. But mostly may Christ go in you, transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm with his. Amen. What an incredible service. With deep gratitude, thank you. We are grateful for your provision towards the, the vision that God gave to Dr. Hagia. Standing on his legacy, we are unwavering now more than ever in our work to end gospel poverty. Thank you for joining us for this special day. We'll be posting this service tomorrow for you to share with others. And we will end this in the same way Dr. Hagia often signed off on his emails. Keep looking 